Well, cool. Thanks for joining everyone for Practical ML Dives. This is a spin-off series of our regular scheduled archive dives, which happen on Fridays. In archive dives, we dive into state-of-the-art research papers and the nitty-gritty details of how AI models work from the map to the model architecture to any findings that they found in the paper. In practical ML dives, uh, it's meant to be a complement to the papers we go over in the deep dives. We'll be talking about the models that we read about on Fridays and try to implement them or run existing code that is out there in the form of GitHub repos that the creators shared. Um, if we get crazy and there isn't a repo that the, creative the creator of the paper shared, maybe we'll implement it ourselves. That seems a little ambitious, um, but we'll at least uh, give you some working code and some working data to run these things in real life. So with that said, I am going to share our, um, let's see, I think I wanna do my whole screen over here. And it'll be pretty similar format to the ones on Friday where we'll be walking through this Notion page. But last week in the actual archive dives, uh, or I guess in the last two weeks, we've been covering state-of-the-art computer vision techniques for image classification. So if you missed those, we talked about vision transformers and we talked about uh, CLIP, which is a zero-shot image classification technique. Uh, both of these have strengths and weaknesses this week, we're gonna give you the code to run both models, compare the strengths, compare the weaknesses, and give you a demo of running these models real time on a webcam, which should be pretty fun. You can download, uh, I've already pre-trained some of these models and I put them into this Oxen repository if you guys wanna download my pre-trained work. Um, but in this, particular dive, we're gonna be doing real-time emotion detection from video. Uh, so I'll give you a demo of what that's gonna look like in a second here. But if you think about emotion classification and, and you map this to what we're gonna show you in a second is we're classifying every frame of a video into seven different emotions, whether that's happy or sad or angry or something like that. And you can imagine an algorithm like this being really useful for, I notice every time I upload a video to YouTube, it suggests a thumbnail. And often in that thumbnail, I'm like very animated and smiling. Um, so I'm guessing that they do some sort of filtering under the hood to try to pick that and say, is there a person in this frame and are they smiling? I believe the same thing happens uh, when you're doing a live photo on your iPhone or your Android phone. If it takes like a burst of photos and recommends one in the middle that's maybe the least blurry and has people smiling. Um, you could also imagine like a fan cam at a sports arena trying to find the most shocked person in the entire set of people and like zoom in on them. Um, even though I'm sure that's a fun job for the person to pan back and forth, you could probably get some great reactions if you automated that or i was even thinking like a robo teacher could change their tone if a student got visibly angry or frustrated so just wanted to list out like some things that we could potentially use this for before we dive into actually running it but let's take a look at the end product before we get started so you can see we have this little frame of my face here, and you kind of have to center yourself, but it's neutral, happy, sad, angry, surprised, surprised? <laughs> Can't get surprised. But this is what we're gonna be building is a real-time tool like this. So let's start with your dev environment. Um, I'm going to be running all of this stuff. I'm just going to be using um, Visual Studio Code for my editor. I'm going to delete all of these things and we're going to start from scratch. Um, there's a requirements.txt 
that I will be sharing with everybody so we can get on the same page there. Um, and I love oops, to use virtual environments um, for my Python workflows so that you don't step on your toes of other projects. Uh, so if you don't know how to create a virtual environment, it's pretty simple. I think we're going to actually be calling this virtual environment BIT. Um, you can go ahead and install the requirements.txt that I will give you. And all of this will be in the blog post. Um, but if you're really wanting to do it right now alongside me, feel free to hop in this Notion page. And there they all are. So where are we going to start? Uh, we know that the end goal is to use a vision transformer like the model that we saw in the paper two weeks ago. And Google actually did a wonderful job of open sourcing these models and releasing the weights. So if you go to Hugging Face, um, you can download the weights of these models. You can see that the model was pre-trained on ImageNet that had 14 million images and 21,000 classes uh, at a re resolution of 224 by 224. Um, and it's actually not that much code to run this model on a single frame um, or a single image. So let's take a look at what that code would look like. Uh, it's about 12 lines of actual Python code. And I modified it slightly just to read a file from the command line, open it. Um, you're going to have this vision uh, transformer image processor that matches the model that we're grabbing. And then we're going to have the vision transformer image classification model that also grabs the model from Hugging Face. We're going to use the processor to process the image into the correct format, which is a PyTorch tensor. We're going to run the model on the inputs to get some outputs. And then eventually, we're going to do just a little access to print out the predicted class and a probability. So hopping over to code, um, we'll just call this run one.py, um, copy and paste all that in there. We will run one, and I'm going to do it on this picture of my dog, um, which if you haven't seen my dog, he's super cute. And we should definitely introduce him into all of these dives. This is him on some rocks here, uh, having a grand old time on a hike. And you can see that the predicted class was Dingo. Uh, and some other names of a dog. He's technically like a cattle dog mix, but that's the only category that we knew in there, and he does kind of look like a dingo. We also printed out the probability of 32% that it was this, so not a super high confidence of what breed he is, but cool that we can just take, what is this? It's like 33 lines of code to actually get a class label and a probability given an image. So given that, um, let's see what happens if we wrap this code in a loop and watch it run real time on your webcam. So we'll add a new file here that's just called webcam.py. Um, in this scenario, we're grabbing that same model from Hugging Face, we're loading the image processor and the model into memory before we start the video capture. We're going to use OpenCV to capture the live feed from my video. We're going to loop over all of the frames with this cap.read function. It basically just returns um, whether or not the read was successful and the image frame itself. We then take that image frame, and we're going to convert it to a pill image um, because that was 
the format uh, that we were using here in our previous example. Then we're going to run that same processor to resize and convert that image into a 20, two, 224 by 224 by 3 tensor that we're going to feed into our model. We're going to get the predicted outputs. We're going to map those outputs to a predicted class. And we're going to just draw that on the video frame. So if we run this, Python webcam.py, this is the model from Google. Um, oh, and this one, I actually realized that I didn't do a great color in the corner. So let's make it uh, red text or blue text. I forget if it's RGB or BGR. But let's look at that again. Um, here we go. So you can see real time trying to predict uh, between those thousand categories that Google trained this model on. Um, and it's picking up on the t-shirt. It keeps thinking neck brace for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, but honestly, it's trying to pick from a thousand different categories and pick one thing in this image. And you can see there's a TV back here and some books and my porch and a water bottle. So it's really hard to like hone in on what the one thing in the image should be. And definitely, there's not the classes um, that we're interested in terms of in terms of emotion recognition. Um, so we're going to take this and see how we can modify our model to instead of outputting those thousand categories, uh, we're going to try to output our our categories of happy, sad, etc. Um, so narrow the scope. You could also see in that final demo, I narrowed what we were actually looking at in the frame. So we didn't have as much noise. Um, but that's kind of where we're headed. So the first thing we need to do is find an emotion data set. Luckily, there's already one out there uh, that's labeled with six main emotion categories, as well as a neutral category. So that's seven total. Uh, I also put the data here on Oxen, if you guys want to check it out. And what it looks like is, oops, actually, why don't we just go to the data itself. Um, you can see the training data here looks like a bunch of small 44 by 44 pixel grayscale images and a label. All these ones happen to be happy, but if you kind of looked later in the data set, there's ones of disgust. And the full seven categories that we have in here are anger, disgust, fear, happy, sad, and surprised, and neutral. So that's kind of the level of granularity that we're going to be looking at. Um, exploring the data set a little more, uh, the training data contains almost 30,000 images, and the test set contains about uh, 3,500 images. If you look at the actual um, distribution of classes within the data set, um, and Oxen actually has like a convenient command to look at these things. Um, but if you went to this link, you cloned the repository locally, and you clicked on this train.csv file, you can download it to your machine, and you can run a SQL query to aggregate it up by label. You can see that there's anywhere from 400 to 7,000 examples in the training set per image. Um, and you could see at the start, it didn't have, it, it was really easy to classify the happy faces that I was making, but I was having a hard time getting it to be surprised or disgusted. And I think part of that is just inherently in the training data, we have way more examples of happy faces than the other ones. Um, so that's super interesting. Uh, and 
also, I think it's important to note just the full, the full format of the data itself. We pretty much have a CSV file um, called train.csv that has a file, which is the relative path to a file here, and then a label, um, which is the actual classification label there. Uh, and then the images on disk are sorted into these directories, um, angry, disgust, fear, happy, neutral, sad, and they literally just look like these small pixelated images. So given that, uh, how are we going to augment the vision transformer model that we ran before and train it on our own data set? Uh, so with frameworks like Hugging Base, they make it really easy to do this. I think all in all, it was about 200 lines of Python code to do the entire training loop. Um, I personally prefer to work in the command line and uh, actual Python scripts to do these things, but feel free to like follow along in a Jupyter notebook if that's more of your speed. Uh, but I'm going to start with a skeleton of the command line arguments that we're going to take and i'm going to fill in our training script from there so the command line arguments that we're going to take and i'll i'll move this over to visual studio call this train.py we're going to take a relative or a path to the data sets that we're going to train and evaluate the model on we're going to have a parameter that's the output where we want to save the actual model files. We're going to take a base model file that we want to train. Um, and then we're also going to take a flag for whether we want to run this on the GPU or not. I'm running this on my MacBook, so I don't have GPU support, so it's going to be pretty slow. But you could, in theory, run this uh, in the cloud on a machine that does have a GPU with just flipping this flag. Um, and so the very first thing that we're going to need to do is read in what the labels are that we want to classify the images into. So if you look at the root of this data set, uh, there is a file called labels.txt that simply is just line delimited, angry, disgust, fear, happy, neutral, sad, surprise. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take that file and we're going to read it in for our mapping of classes to indices. For a lot of this basic code that's just like reading in files and creating data sets, I started to work on this AI dive library uh, where we can start having reusable components in standard formats so that we can fit all of this stuff into a 45 minute session. Um, so if you want to find that library, uh, we'll kind of be extending it over time. I just wrote it in the past week to give us something to get going with, but you can pip install it as AI dive. Uh, Alex asked if this is an M series Mac. Um, the one that I'm on is actually Intel. So I think that's part of the reason that it's a little slower. I think if you tried the same code on an M1 chip, that would be faster. And I even have some timing at the bottom of this to show you like how long it took me to run it on this machine versus how long it took me to run on a Lambda Labs GPU. And spoiler alert, it's like eight, my, eight hours to train on this machine versus less than one hour on a larger GPU. So pretty speedy. Uh, but back to the dive library. Um, like I said, I'm going to be putting in reusable components into here so that we can simply do things like from ai.dive.data.label reader, let's read in a, a labels file, um, just because that's kind of like the boring work, to be honest. We're going we're gonna to do that for you. Um, and so what this looks like, is we add it to our actual code here, we need to import OS, um, but you can give it 
the path to that data directory, the labels file itself, and then it'll just put it into this nice object that we can reuse later. Um, so Python train, it, requ it requires these arguments. Um, I already have them set up here, and you can see we just read in the seven labels and printed them out so far. So pretty straightforward. Um, loading the training data set into memory. Um, we already saw how we can use the VIT image processor to run it real time on your webcam. This module basically just takes the image and translated, translates it into PyTorch tensors. Um, I've already also written a lot of the data loading code, and I put it into this image file classification data set class in our dive repo. Again, this is all open source, so if you want to like go and look under the hood for some of these things, I encourage you to go read the code line by line. But the idea is we're going to import our image file classification data set, as well as the vision transformer for image classification, which is that hugging face model, and then the VIT image processor, which is the code to take a raw image and put it into the um, PyTorch tensor. So to take a look at what that would look like in practice, we instantiate our image processor from the base model. We grab the train.csv file from that data directory. Uh, we then instantiate this data set. Um, Hugging Face also has a data sets library. Um, since this data wasn't hosted on Hugging Face and I just wanted to show you how to do it directly from your machine, I just have this to Hugging Face data set function that will put it in that format to make it really easy to train. Um, but if we run this script again, we will see uh, we loaded the labels. Now it's going through those 28,000 images and loading them all into memory in our format. Um, since this does take a little bit of time to load it all into memory, I added this num samples parameter to our data loader to speed up our iteration process. And we can always remove that later to train on the full data set. Um, you can see it's taking a second here to convert it to a hugging face data set. And it, it just printed out the first example um, of the data itself. So you can see it's pretty simple. It's just a dictionary. And the first key in there are the pixel values, which is basically a three-dimensional tensor of 3 by 224 by 224. Um, three is the number of channels in the image, 224 is the width, and 224 is the height. And then it also read in from those labels files uh, and mapped to the index. So in here you can see label is three, and that really just corresponds to the third index in our labels file. Um, if you remember from this labels.txt file, uh, this would be zero, this would be one, this would be two, and so happy is the third one. Um, so that's all this code does is load that into a nice data set that we can iterate over when we get to training. Um, and so, like I said, three maps to happy from the labels.txt and the overall structure of each row of that data set is something like this, where it's like pixel values to a tensor and then label to three. If you're wondering uh, at this step why we started with 44 by 44 pixel grayscale images, and this data loader now has a 224 by 224 by three color image, that's because of the vision transformer image processor. Um, and I was curious about this myself, of how it handles 
going from the images that you have to the correct size and the correct format to feed it into a vision transformer. Um, and by default, what this processor does is it does a resize. So this is all from the hugging face documentation. It defaults to resizing to 224 by 224. And then it does a what's called a bilinear sampling to get there. Um, so what that really would look like in practice is we have an image that's like 44 pixels by 44 pixels here. And they do this bilinear sampling to blow it up. It's going to be really blurry. And this is what we're actually feeding into the model at this point. I mentioned this just because uh, it's pretty important to have what you're running your model in in real life match what you trained it on. Uh, so for one, uh, upsampling this image is actually super inefficient. We're now feeding the model uh, 150,000 data points rather than if we just did a 1 by 44 by 44, we're feeding the model a smaller subset. Uh, so we could get away with a much smaller, more efficient network if we wanted to build our own thing from scratch and feed it in the 44 by 44 pixels. But the thing we're leveraging here is the fact that Google has already pre-trained this transformer on a bunch of 224 by 224 image or size images from that ImageNet data set. So if we were to build our own model from scratch, we might not get the same performance as using this bootstrapped model that we already are. So we're taking this trade off of a little more computationally expensive for the fact that we probably don't have to train it on as much data. And if you wanted to deploy this model on the edge where you can't actually run this Python library or the VIT image processor code, think like an iOS app, it's very important that you use the matching transforms and methods to go from the raw image feed to something that looks like this. Uh, otherwise, your model's not going to perform as well as it did when you're evaluating. So next, we're going to use those same classes to read in the test.csv file from our data set. So exactly like we did with the training data set, we're going to concatenate the data directory with the test.csv file, pass that to our image file classification data set class, and convert it to a hugging base data set. So let's go ahead and do that in our actual code over here. And let's go ahead and also reduce the number of samples we have here uh, to like the first 100. So we're not going to, in this demo, when we train, we're just going to train on like the first 100 images and test on the first 100 images as well, just to speed up our iteration cycle. Next, what we're going to want to do is load the model that we used previously in the webcam demo. So pretty straightforward. It's that VIT for image classification class. But in this case, um, if you remember from our webcam example, it was kind of a one-liner um, model equals VIT for image classification from pre-trained. And you just pass in this hugging face namespace. In our case, we're going to be changing what the actual labels are, uh, and we're reducing it down to those seven emotions. So you have to pass in the number of labels that we're using, and then these mappings from label name to ID and ID to label name. Uh, so not that many tweaks, but this is the core piece of code that allows you to introduce your set of labels. And then finally, we're going to train the model. So first, let me take this and put it into our training script. I heard oh, Scott, no questions yet. I just have a little bloop. 
Uh, Danielle, go ahead. Or Daniel, yeah, sorry. Uh, if you want to go ahead. Hey, uh, thank you. I just had a quick question. So in this case, uh, if the, uh, I might be missing something here. So the VAT is designed to classify over some pre-trained number of classes. Does when you specify num labels, does that just change the like the output layer that does the class like the classification head, or is that like handled automatically? In the yeah, exactly. Data? So okay. under the hood, they've kind of like taken off their final layer of the model and replaced it with a classification head with the number of labels that you have. So they kind of abstract that away for you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Yep. Evan, you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if this was already discussed or if it's pl planned on being discussed, but I'm wondering like what the relationship is between class imbalance and the pre-trained models. Like I know if you have a really, really lopsided uh, number of uh, examples for a specific class, if you're training a model from scratch, it's like almost impossible to get it to ever predict something like that. Yep. So like this pre-training help with that is what I'm wondering. Yeah, in theory, I think the pre-training, that's, that's a big benefit to the pre-training is it's seeing a bunch of different humans in the ImageNet data set, whether or not they were smiling or frowning or whatever, I'm, I'm not sure, but it at least has picked up on like categorical features like eyes and nose and all that stuff so that you don't have to learn those things from scratch. And hopefully this fine tuning step can just hone in on the faces, combine those features in a new way and, and make it much easier. You're, you're saying it, it has a much easier job of learning new class because it has higher level level primitives to work with than uh, raw pixel yeah. data. Okay. Yep. Exactly. It does seem to still have like I mean even when we saw earlier with Greg with you trying to get it to do the surprised or the the you know grimace face. Um, I think it do, does still have a harder time and and will tend to shift the distribution away from it. But it seems like it's at least able to. Unlike Evan, you were saying it's just going to never pick that class because it it hasn't seen enough. Totally. Um, Cameron had a good point of people are less likely to post pictures of themselves as disgusted, I guess, which is probably fair. <laughs> uh, Cameron also said, I learned that with the imbalanced class, at least for a convolutional neural network, the model learns it has a higher chance of being right if it guesses the most frequent class, which is also a great way to like, <laughs> I feel like that's usually the first thing that the model learns as kind of cheating is it's like, well, I've seen a lot of happy faces in here. So if I always guess happy, then I'm going to get 33% accuracy on the seven classes, which is not a great model, but it's the easiest first thing that it can try. Cool. So then there's also a lot of parameters that you can pass in to your training function that we're going to run. Uh, a few to highlight here are the output directory where you're going to want to save the model, the number of epics, which are how many times we're going to loop through the entire data set, how often we want to save checkpoints for the intermediate models, because these things do take a relatively long time to train. Sometimes it's nice to save out some intermediate ones to evaluate them along the way, how often we want to evaluate the model given the test set, and then uh, the total limit of models that we want to save. Each one of these models can be hundreds of megabytes for bigger models. They could be gigabytes. So if you're saving every thousand steps during training and you save all of those over time, you could just like blow up your disk space. So this is saying we're only going to save the latest, the last two models as we're training over time given the number of steps that you're taking. And then all of this can be passed into a trainer class. The trainer class's job is to loop over our data set however many times we specified above and uh, train the model given the training data set and evaluate the model given the evaluation data set. Um, it takes in the training args that we defined above, the model that we defined above, and then these couple helper functions. One, to take those pixel values and labels that we had above in that 
little dictionary and stack them into torch tensors. We're going to be feeding these into the model in bat in batches, and we specified a batch size of 16 up here. So this trainer class takes this data collator function that's going to help you make all of these batches. And then since this is a classification task, you can also say we want to compute metrics as we go on the evaluation data set. And the metrics that we want to compute in this case are just pure accuracy. Um, so you can give it a little function callback to do that as well. But other than that, it's pretty much just trainer.train. So let us copy these over into our script and watch it in action. So we instantiate the training arguments. We need this training arguments class from the transformers library. And then we're going to need the trainer class from the transformer library, this load metric from the data sets library. And then we're going to need torch and numpy for a couple of these uh, for the collate function and for the compute metrics function down here. Other than that, pretty straightforward. So it looks good. Oh, no, collate function. There we go. So let's see what happens if we do that. Remember, we just we limited the number of training examples and eval samples here. Uh, so it's not going to be a full train, but we loaded train data set, loaded the eval data set, and now this progress bar right here is going to be the model training, and it's doing about uh, one iteration per five or six seconds. Uh, so that's not super fast, but um, we are going to be able to iterate over the whole data set here. Are these, I'm going to kill that. Sorry, are these like, was that like 20 epics, like 20 full passes through your 100 that you selected out, or is it one pass? That is one iteration, so that's like one batch that we're cool. feeding through. Yep. Uh, so your computer will start chugging through all of that data. It logs everything to TensorBoard, which is really nice. Uh, so whatever path that you passed in to the training arguments right here, that's where it's going to save all of your metrics and have nice visualizations for you in TensorBoard. Like I said, I already ran these models. And so I'll give you some examples of what it looks like in reality. Um, if this will load, there we go. This is our loss metric. So this is the model learning over time um, and improving, improving its accuracy um, on the training set. And this is the actual accuracy metric on the eval set. So you can see um, from the first like 1,000 examples, it saw it got somewhere in the 50% accuracy. Then it went up to almost 60. Um, and we finished somewhere around the 70% accuracy um, given this many steps or iterations through uh, or batches of data that we fed it. So the total training time, which I alluded to before, um, this machine that I was just running it on is like a Mint uh, Intel Mac. Um, I also ran it on a MacBook Pro with an M1 chip that gave like 4.5 seconds per iteration so it's all one batch of data every 4.5 seconds um if you think of that our batch size was 16 so we're seeing like four images per second um if you kind of extrapolate this out 
uh, there's 28,000 images in the data set. Uh, if we were to see 4 per point four per second um, and did the math on that, it's going to take like two hours to go through the whole data set. And we set the num train epics to four, which is where I got that eight hour number. And it did indeed take about eight hours on my Mac. I also tried the same code using that use GPU flag um, on a, a video NVIDIA's GPU that gave us like a 10 X speed up. So we were actually seeing like 0.35 seconds per iteration, um, which means it took about an hour to complete. So I just always love to point this out that like, although it is fun and free to train your model locally on your MacBook, uh, it also would probably only cost you like 50 cents to spin up a GPU and run it for an hour, depending on what level of GPU you are. So like, I definitely think it's worth paying for that one hour of compute rather than waiting for a model to train overnight, especially if you have a bunch of different experiments that you want to run. Um, I totally think it's worth it. And finally, to save the model, uh, it's just a couple lines that you'll want to end. You'll want to add to the end of your script. Um, and so this trainer.train doesn't actually, well, it saves the intermediate steps because we added uh, this save steps argument to our training arguments, but it's always good to do like one final save of the model at the end of your script. And um, you can also save the state of all of the other training parameters that are happening under the hood so that you could resume this model training um, if you wanted to. Concretely, I don't think after four epics, the model was done learning. It looked like it probably had a little more to do. So even though we got to like almost 70% accuracy, I feel like if I had let it go longer than four epics, we probably would have seen higher accuracy, but that's just a little tip there. Um, Sorry, it's me. Um, there was a yeah, there was a question in the chat from Cameron around this kind of like clip mediated fine tuning and how that compares to kind of like fine tuning on CNNs where you're unfreezing certain layers and and you know nudging weights. Um, curious about that as well. Yes, so I did a few experiments here um, with clip and Fresnet and vision transformer. And I used the same um, training arguments for all of them and just swapped out which model we're using. Uh, I, for this particular data set, here were the results. Um, I got 69% accuracy with a vision transformer, 64% accuracy with a ResNet. And with just zero shot clip, I got like 53% accuracy. Is that what you were asking? Sorry, um, the question, I should have just read it, was would this transformer model support doing transfer learning by bringing over the model starting at different layers? Example, when I did transfer learning with ResNet and VGG, could experiment by using the whole model or start unfreezing the weights that a defined block um, and are transformers uh, like that or is it, you know, you're changing everything or nothing? Yes, got it. Um, so transformers have different numbers of layers that you could train them with. I forget the exact depth of the vision transformer. I think it was something like 16 layers, if I remember from the paper that we read. Um, and so, yes, you totally could keep the pre-trained layers from the lower part and just replace or unfreeze the layers in the top part or relate replace them with whatever, whatever you wanted. Um, I didn't look into what it would look like to do that in this step here, but I kind of remember from the documentation, there's like a, uh, a parameter that you can add here to say which layers you want to strip out or which layers you want to um, add your model to. We'd have to look at yeah. the documentation for this. When, Greg, when I when I uh, I found that when I 
imported less of the model, especially with small black and white images versus what the transfer learning model was trained on, I found that it the accuracy went up from the 60s into the 80s. Oh, wow. That's I awesome. Had, yeah. I was just thinking some, I just went and grabbed food, so I, I missed the conversation, but I think what I heard is kind of along the same lines is exactly what I was thinking, which is like going back to our discussion about um, class imbalance being helped by having better low level primitives. Like what if you just uh, set the the like early layers in the model to non-trainable? Um, like you're basically just reducing the number of trainable parameters by like a great deal. And then that also leads to like a lot of other indirect benefits. I'm wondering if that would help because then you could, you could almost use it as like a regularization step. So you could really yeah. have a, you could really hammer in like a pretty intense objective function that's that normally would find, like over tune to your, your specific data set. But if you're only letting it observe those high level features in those later layers, I wonder, like I'm, I'm really wondering if that would work. Totally. And I think it is interesting to even experiment with like what layers we're using, um, especially for these small black and white <laughs> images. Like, do we need any of those upper layers that it learned off of ImageNet? Maybe just the lower layer yeah, features that, that it learned could be good for these ones. Um, interesting. Cool. So I know we're kind of running up on time here, but I did want to show you why <laughs> Clip is so cool in this scenario and how you would run it. Um, so if you remember from the Clip paper, we can do all of this without actually training a model. So there's, instead of your VIT processor and your VIT model, um, the transformers library also has a clip processor and a clip model. So same first steps you would do to import them. Um, same first steps to like open the image. But what's cool is you can just define these class labels and they can literally be any words in the English language. And then you can define a prompt that uses them. And so in this case, I defined it just a template here that's like, a photo of a face that is happy, a photo of a face that's sad, a photo of a face that's surprised. So I have three categories here. Uh, you can just pass that into the pro processor as a set of prompts, and then you can pass in the image like we did before. Um, this padding variable is just in case you had prompts of different lengths. In this case, we actually don't. So you probably wouldn't need that, but it's good to keep in just in case. You do the same steps, run the model through, um, grab the probabilities and grab the predicted label. And so we went from a model that was trained uh, on all of these like captions from the internet of, of photos. And now we can just like define our classes on the fly. So I will make this clip.py um and maybe even we'll just add dog <laughs> and we'll do a photo of a uh happy person sad person surprised person or dog and then i'll also get um my image from the command line here and we'll do finn again finn my dog uh, and see if this can just do it off of the labels that we give it. So Python clip desktop thin rocks. Let's see what happens. Uh, I might not have downloaded this model to this machine yet, so it might take a second to download. But the idea here, if you missed our talk last week, Logits isn't defined. No, it is not. We need Logits per image. Uh, this is going to be a little slower than our vision, pure vision transformer. Um, and that is also out of bounds because I think it's like this. Live code is always fun. The, the clip model is going to encode every single one of these sentences with a language model. 
and then it's going to run uh, a vision transformer to encode the image model. And then it's going to predict between those four encoded sentences. And you can see, we just gave it those four classes and it predicted dog. And we didn't even have to do any training or anything there, which is pretty awesome. Um, I want to also see if it can do an aux because I think that would be fun. And I have this generative aux with wings <laughs> that I did. Uh, and let's just like see what happens with this. So let's download this mag. What is that called? So on the fly, no retraining, just adding a new category of aux and it did it. So that's pretty awesome. I feel like there's a lot of use cases there for, um, for example, if you don't have a predefined set of classes beforehand, or if you're like building a product where you're letting the user define the classes, like imagine you're building a Google Photos or an Apple Photos, and you wanted the user just to be able to organize their own photos with their own tags, you could let them just purely type in like nature or dog or whatever, and it could just organize those things into folders. So I think that's a pretty cool use case. And you could have like a non-technical portion on your team sift through the data and start doing classifications without spending that hour of training a model. So in conclusion, I think uh, these models are awesome. I think it's pretty wild that <laughs> it's only a couple hundred lines of code to train and benchmark a VIT versus a ResNet versus a zero shot clip. And we'll be posting all of this code, all of the data, all of that stuff in a blog version of this. Um, but I'll stop there and ask if anybody has any other questions, I'll stop the, the video as well. <laughs>